Now, class, in order to pass the class of life, you have to get past me. So, on the count of three, listen and repeat. Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He found our continent in 1492. He found our continent in 1492. But how could he find something that was never lost? Miss <laughs> Smith. Come up to your desk if you don't want to be dismissed. Ain't that like you to dismiss her voice like that? I've seen teachers turn preachers and theories become divine truth. Desks are our youth's pews while we're forced to breathe in toxic holy spirits. Monday through Friday, we worship school like these crosswords are supposed to save me. These crosswords don't seem like nothing but another monument to hang your white savior complexes on. <laughs> Who bears the cross? Who pays the cost? Who, Who gets, gets whitewashed? Columbus became a hero. Cleopatra was painted white. Elizabeth Taylor? Come, Come on, on neighbors. neighbors. <laughs> and if I ask to change the national anthem, you want to fight. Is it miseducation or unconscious hating? I gotta know, cause y'all no damn well, no one ain't look like Russell Crowe. <laughs> and whose lives get cracked but our black and brown bodies because nobody told us it was going to be war. Mm -hmm. Fighting for the rest of our lives, trying to unlearn your mistruths. Lies. Lies. And we already know your excuse. I only teach what was taught to me. Like a misguided game of telephone that never ends. Whole fabrications pass down generation to generation until nobody knows how to get back to the truth. You've, You've been, been miseducated too. too. I heard that history repeats, and that made me afraid, believing that slavery would come for me one day. But we will rise to write realities, no negotiating narratives, like the ones that made me believe black skin was embarrassing. My kids' heads hang heavy, holding paper mache minds, trying to mold us into model minorities. Seems to forget that we ain't crossed this border. Your, Your border, border crossed, crossed us. us. Send us to the other side, like we ain't the ones keeping this goddamn grass green, every particle of dirt under my father's fingernails, an article erased from our history books. The culture of power is 45 minutes away from my neighborhood at a university they say I can only get into because I'm Latina. But never mind our brilliant literacies that go viral on every radio station. Never mind our cultural pedagogies that research begs to understand. Never mind our resilience that keeps us from shooting up schools despite the constant bullying and degradation we get from our very own teachers and district leaders. Mental health is not an excuse we get to have despite the decades of trauma. <laughs> Mental health is not an excuse we get to have despite the decades of trauma that we relive in classrooms constructed from leftover white middle class ideologies. Everything I ever needed to know, I learned from my grandfather's rough hand. Fingers bent, lined with prints like road maps, reminding me of where I've been and where I'm going, showing me that our true roots be steep. Deeper than the miniseries, because our history of bravery didn't start with slavery. I learned from long talks on my abuela's front porch that our privileges come with painful sacrifice. I learned to understand the threat of violence against my black body from Between the World and Me by Ta-Nehisi Coates. I learned about solidarity when I was down, like no other, and I learned that love Real love don't come with a color. I learned from my father that the roots are the strongest part of the tree and to bend for nothing and no one. So listen, we're not trying to rewrite the history books. We'll just unlearn what isn't true. So 
Step into our classroom. Listen to our stories. And if you think this task is too hard or too much to do, then we'll kindly ask, who miseducated you? Before we continue, let us acknowledge that the University of Michigan is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations made the largest single land transfer to the University of Michigan. This was offered ceremonially as a gift through the treaty at the foot of the rapids so that their children could be educated. Through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to the university are renewed and reaffirmed. And as we honor Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy, we also acknowledge and honor the indigenous peoples whose ancestral land we now live and learn on. Welcome. Welcome to the 34th annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day Symposium here at the University of Michigan. I'm Robert Sellers, Vice Provost for Equity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer here at the University of Michigan. It is my pleasure to host this morning's celebration of the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King this represents one of the largest celebrations of its kind happening in the country today. Before we go any further, please join me in thanking the Guild for getting us started this morning with their wonderful, thoughtful, powerful performance. I'd like to welcome those of you watching today's symposium on our live stream feed, whether you're at the Detroit Center, our Dearborn and Flint campuses, or over in Rackham, or any other part of this campus or the world today, welcome. I'd also like to extend a welcome to the high school students and parents from Detroit Southfield and Ypsilanti, who have joined us today as part of the Wolverine Pathways pre-college program, as well as the other middle and high school students who are with us. Would you please stand and be acknowledged? This year's MLK Symposium was organized, as always, by our MLK Planning Committee, which is made up of a group of dedicated students, staff, and faculty from all across our campus. In addition, the Office of Academic Multicultural Initiatives, OAMI, provides major administrative support to the Planning Committee and planning process. Would you please stand if you're a member of the MLK Planning Committee and or OAMI? Finally, I'd like to recognize and thank our undergraduate interns who for the past year have worked tirelessly to make this program what it is today. I want to thank them for their consistent support and effort in making this event possible. Jolena Chiangong, 
and Regis Haynes. Would you both please stand if you're in the audience? Actually, I believe they're backstage, so let all of that uh, warmth uh, shine on them. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Mark S. Schlissel, the 14th president of the University of Michigan. During his five and a half years here at the University of Michigan, Mark has committed himself personally, as well as his pres presidency, to making the University of Michigan a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. He has consistently made it clear, both publicly and in some less public ways, that diversity, equity, and inclusion must be both a core value as well as standard operating procedure if the university is to ever meet its full potential and truly become leaders and best. I have personally witnessed Mark display both courage and leadership in the face of significant challenges to our DEI efforts. He understands that fundamental cultural change, which is what we are after, is neither fast nor simple, and it definitely is not easy. It requires all of us to always keep our eyes on the prize as we keep on keeping on. Because in the words of that old Negro spiritual, we are no ways tired. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our leader, President Mark S. Schlissel. Thanks very much, Rob, for the introduction. And I also want to thank Rob, who's our Chief Diversity Officer, for his great work and deep commitment to the University of Michigan and to our highest values. U of M's Martin Luther King Jr. Symposium is one of our nation's largest university celebrations of the life and legacy of Dr. King. It was born out of student activism in the 1980s and today is one of the best ways that U of M fulfills its mission as a public university. I want to express my personal thanks to the faculty, students, and staff all across our campus who've made this symposium so special including the Symposium Planning Committee, the Office of Academic Multicultural Initiatives, of course, our special guest who you'll meet in a few minutes, Dr. Angela Davis, the, this morning's other speakers and performers and sponsors, and the individuals and units throughout our campus who are hosting events as part of this symposium over the next few weeks. One of those is our Children and Youth Program, which is taking place today in the Modern Languages Building directly behind Hill. Now in its 22nd year, it's coordinated by Dr. Henry Mears in our School of Education. The program invites hundreds of K through 12 students from the region to participate in educational activities that commemorate Dr. King's dream and his significance. In 1964, Dr. King shared his view on our nation's system of education while accepting the John Dewey Award from the United Federation of Teachers. He decried the intentional lack of investment in schools and educators by the richest nation on earth. He denounced the systematic denial of educational opportunities to African Americans, calling it out as the historical design to submerge African Americans in second class status. And he asserted that the field of education has been a battleground in the freedom struggle. The struggle is no less imperative today. The symposium theme this year asks our community to consider the important idea of the miseducation of us. I believe that honest self examination must be a foundational value of a public research university. When we use the power of inquiry honed over the generations at places like the University of Michigan, 
we give ourselves the opportunity to make needed changes, to acknowledge our failures, and to live up to our mission to serve all members of society. Only through a commitment to assessing the system, our shared history, and how we tell our story can we be a better, more just, and more inclusive, and more excellent university. Later this month, as part of the symposium, journalists Nicole Hannah-Jones and Rochelle Riley will be discussing the New York Times' 1619 Project and how slavery continues to shape American life. At the University of Michigan, we've worked to examine how we can better address inequities in our society and improve education for all. Our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative is in its fourth year, and I'm committed to renewing and extending it beyond the original five-year timeline. The DEI strategic plans include robust assessment and evaluation. Thanks to many individuals on our campus, we're creating a culture that aspires to ever-increasing levels of positive change. We've worked to be more accessible. This year, more than 22% of new in-state undergraduates are from families with incomes below $65,000, with the vast majority of them paying no tuition under our Go Blue guarantee. We are striving to create a world without educational privilege. Through our Center for Academic Innovation, a growing number of faculty and collaborators are committed to transforming the system as we know it. And we're continually interpreting our history as a university. The recently launched History of the University of Michigan site includes stories about moments when we did not live up to our values, such as women not being allowed to enter the Michigan Union without an escort or turning away African-American women in our dorms. And in an era where some states have been accused of voter suppression, our students have stepped up to make sure their voices are heard at the polls. <laughs> Student turnout tripled in the 2018 midterm elections under the Big Ten voting challenge. U of M is now part of the Michigan Collegiate Voting Challenge to encourage registration and turnout for the critical November 2020 election. <laughs> 52 years ago, Dr. King visited Gross Point High School in our state. The title of his speech was The Other America. He spoke of an America where children grow up in the sunlight of opportunity. But there's another America, he said, one that has daily ugliness about it that transforms the buoyancy of hope into the fatigue of despair, and in which thousands of young people are deprived of an opportunity to get an adequate education. As we celebrate Dr. King's legacy, I implore everyone in the University of Michigan community to challenge the future of education, to expose and end miseducation within our society, and to seek to uphold the greatest aspirations of Dr. King's dream. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to introduce a video message from the keynote lecture's two sponsors. Scott DeRue is the Edward J. Fry Dean of Business and the Stephen M. Ross Professor of Business. And Ward Manuel is the Donald R. Shepard Director of Athletics here at the University of Michigan. Now the video. Hello, I'm Scott DeRue, Dean of the Ross School of Business here at the University of Michigan, and it is my privilege uh, to be part of this keynote lecture, co-sponsored by the University's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Michigan Athletics, and the Ross School of Business. I want to begin with a very special thank you to Dr. Rob Sellers and his entire team at the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for their hard work and commitment in bringing together this series of conversations, keynotes, workshops, all in service uh, and honoring Dr. King's legacy.
We at the Ross School of Business have a long history of partnering to support programs that honor Dr. King's legacy and unite us as a collaborative community with a shared commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is this notion of inclusion that is a core value of our institution. It's, it's woven through the cultural and social fabric of everything that we do. It shapes how we think, how we act, how we connect with each other. And it is one reason I am so proud to be part of this university community of faculty, students, staff, alumni, partners across the globe with this shared and unwavering commitment to building a more diverse, equitable, an inclusive society. And it is to this end that I'm privileged uh, to be part of a team welcoming Dr. Angela Davis to our community and to our Michigan family. Thank you and forever, go blue. As a director of athletics, I speak frequently with our student athletes, coaches and staff about our unique ability to partner across campus with departments in schools and colleges at this institution. Our student athletes, along with our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, work collaboratively with the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the Office of Academic Multicultural Initiatives, and the Stephen M. Ross School of Business to plan this year's keynote event at Hill Auditorium. The resulting program is one that we hope brings together the U of M campus and the Ann Arbor community to reflect on Dr. King's teaching. Thank you for joining us and go blue. Jereen Fish is a 2019 graduate of the Ford School of Public Policy with a focus on international economic development and human rights policy. Now she is pursuing her master's of management degree at U of M's Ross School of Business, where she is an active member of the Ross Leaders Academy. At the University of Michigan, Jereen is a student athlete competing in sprints and jumps on the varsity track and field team. As an undergraduate, Jereen interned for the Wolverine Pathways and the National Family Planning and Reproductive Health Association. On campus, she has been extremely active as a student leader. Jereen served as the Vice President of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Vice President of the Black Undergrad Law Association, the Outreach Chair for Students of Color in Public Policy, and a writer for the South Campus Times, to name a few. She has made remarkable contributions in her role as a peer advisor for her fellow undergraduates in the Ford School. After completing her master's and final year of eligibility on the track and field team, she plans to attend law school. Please welcome to the stage, Jereen Fish. Thank you, President Schlissel. Dean DeRue and Director Manuel for such a kind introduction. I would also like to thank the co-sponsors of today's events, the Office of Academic Multicultural Initiatives, the Stephen M. Ross School of Business, and the Michigan Athletic Department. And to you all, it is such a privilege to share this space with you this morning. Martin Luther King Day has never been a day off from learning, and I am grateful we get to honor him by listening and learning from one of the greatest educators, activists, abolition feminist, black revolutionist, and leaders of all time. <laughs> Through her activism and scholarship over many decades, Angela Davis has been deeply involved in movements for social justice around the world. Her work as an educator, both at the university level and in the larger public sphere, has always emphasized the importance of building communities of struggle for economic, racial, and gender justice. Professor Davis' teaching career has taken her to San Francisco State University, Mills College, and UC Berkeley. She has also taught at UCLA, Vassar, Syracuse University, the Claremont Colleges, and Use, uh, and Stanford University. Most recently, she has spent 15 years at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she is now Distinguished Professor Emerita of History of Consciousness, 
an interdisciplinary PhD program, and of feminist studies. Angela Davis is the author of 10 books and has lectured throughout the United States, as well as in Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, and South America. In recent years, a persistent theme of her work has been the range of social problems associated with the incarceration and the generalized criminalization of those communities that are most affected by poverty and racial discrimination. She draws upon her own experiences in the early 70s as a person who spent 18 months in jail and on trial after being placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. She has also conducted extensive research on numerous issues related to race, gender, and imprisonment. Her books include Abolition Democracy and Our Prisons Obsolete about the abolition of the prison industrial complex. They also include a new edition of the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass and a collection of essays entitled The Meaning of Freedom. Her most recent book of essays called Freedom is a Constant Struggle, Ferguson, Palestine, and the Foundations of Movements was published in February 2016. Angela Davis is a founding member of Critical Resistance, a national organization dedicated to the dismantling of the prison industrial complex. Internationally, she is affiliated with Sisters Inside, an abolitionist organization based in Queensland, Australia, that works in solidarity with women in prison. <laughs> like many educators, Professor Davis is especially concerned with the general tendency to devote more resources and attention to the prison system than to educational institutions. Impressive, right? <laughs> Having helped to popularize the notion of a prison industrial complex, she now urges her audiences to think seriously about the future possibility of a world without prisons and to help forge a 21st century abolitionist movement. <laughs> With the future on our mind, I'd like us to remember there is no future without the present. In Martin Luther King Jr.'s Give Us the Ballot Address, he referred to voting as one of our most sacred rights. Thus, my challenge to you is to not just honor his legacy today, but every day, including Tuesday, November 3rd, as I encourage you all to get out there and vote. With no further ado, it is with great pleasure that I welcome to the podium our 2020 MLK Symposium keynote speaker, the distinguished Professor Angela Davis. I don't think I've heard such an enthusiastic audience for a while. <laughs> but let me say it is really wonderful to be back at the University of Michigan again. I have fond memories of visiting this campus over the years, and for me, the Detroit area has always been a center of important movements. <laughs> Labor movements, anti-racist movements, and I think of the role played by such leaders as James and Grace Lee Boggs, whose <laughs> legacies are still very much alive. And I also must say I appreciate uh, the land acknowledgement uh, 
Um, and it seems to me, it seems to me that every university in this country needs to develop a land acknowledgement, uh, acknowledging the fact that the U.S. is a settler colonial nation. And the need for ongoing solidarity with indigenous struggles all over the Americas. I'd like to thank all of the sponsors and co-sponsors of this event. They have been named several times. I'm very... <laughs> Should I name them again? <laughs> But I'm very happy to have been invited to join you in your celebration of the birthday of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. You know, I, um, I don't usually mention the fact that I met Dr. King when I was very young. Um, I think I was 12 years old. Um, um, but I thought about mentioning it um, uh, today because I remembered a conversation with a group of elementary school um, students. Um, I love the theme of, 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 of this symposium, uh, the miseducation of us. Uh, and in my own community, I live in Oakland, California. <laughs> And I always try to visit um, schools in my neighborhood and in my community. Um, not long ago, I was visiting an elementary school during Black History Month, and, and, and the students started to ask me, um, uh, well, did you ever meet Dr. King? And I said, well, yes, I did. Uh, did you meet Rosa Parks? And I said, yes, I met her as well. And then another student said, did you meet Malcolm X? <laughs> and I said, uh, Malcolm came to um, speak at an event at um, my university when I was in undergraduate uh, school. So yes, I met him. And then one, one child asked, well, did you meet Harriet Tubman? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, actually, I never had the opportunity <laughs> to meet Harriet Tubman, but there's a good reason why. <laughs> Does anyone know? And, and uh, this young student, uh, surprised me by saying, um, you couldn't have met Harriet Tubman because she died in 1913. <laughs> so I was very impressed. <laughs> Although I have to admit that at another event, um, and, and another visit to another school, uh, um, one student asked me whether I'd ever been a slave. And I said, well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on what you mean. <laughs> but I was talking about uh, my uh, first encounter with Dr. King. It was, um, I, I think I was 12 years uh, old at the time. And I was attending a youth conference in Atlanta uh, where he had been invited to speak. And I remember introducing myself to him on the elevator and telling him how much I appreciated the work he was doing. This was not long um, after the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, some years later, in the summer of 1967, at the height of the Vietnam War, and not long after his um, renowned address at the Riverside Church, I heard him speak in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, which is where I'm from. 
And I still remember how troubled many people in the audience seemed because of his almost exclusive focus on the need to end the war in Vietnam. But at the same time, I remember feeling very much affirmed in my own convictions. Uh, uh, the very first massive social justice march I had participated in was a ban the bomb march across the George Washington Bridge in New York. And during the years I spent studying in Frankfurt, Germany, I joined many demonstrations against the war, uh, some of which were organized by the uh, German uh, socialist student organization in which I was active. Like many others, I instinctively knew that opposition to the war was integrally tied to our hopes to end racism. As King insisted in his Riverside Address, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And I am certain that uh, if he were alive today, he would be critical of the most recent defense bill um, that amounts to $738 billion, and including $1.375 billion in homeland security uh, for the wall along the southern border. Less than the five billion sought by um, <laughs> what is his name? Um, I'd rather actually I'd rather not pronounce his name. Um, Because, of course, in African traditions, naming is according power. <laughs> Today, as we celebrate the birthday of Dr. King, we don't direct our focus toward one single human being. Dr. King would be the first person to insist that the movement was far greater than its spokespeople. Thus, as we observe this national holiday, let us use it as an occasion to reflect on all of those who participated in the mid 20th century black freedom movement. And let us also remember, that, let us also remember that it was not only a civil rights movement, but rather a freedom movement more broadly. As a matter of fact, when Dr. King was assassinated, he was offering solidarity to sanitation workers who were on strike in Memphis. And let us also remember that SCLC was in the process of organizing a poor people's occupation of Washington. There's also another layer here. With MLK Day, we celebrate not only the spirit of what we refer to as the civil rights movement, but also the fact that the declaration of King's birthday as a holiday, as an official holiday, the third Monday of each January, that this was the outcome of a very long struggle. 
And there was a time when it seemed unlikely that we would ever set aside a day to reflect on and pay tribute to Dr. King and to all of those who fought a sustained battle to end racial segregation during our country's 20th century abolitionist movement. And as a matter of fact, because I'm in Michigan, I want to acknowledge the role that John Conyers played. John Conyers and Shirley Chisholm were absolutely central in this. Thanks to their work, the bill was signed in 1983, and the first celebration was in 1986. But it was not until the year 2000, this is only 20 years ago, that all states began to observe the holiday. But of course, in the meantime, Stevie Wonder wrote and performed his happy birthday song, which is not only the happy birthday song to Dr. King, but rather the song, the unofficial happy birthday song in, in most black households at least, right? <laughs> Six million people sign petitions. The NFL moved the Super Bowl one year from Phoenix to Pasadena because Arizona refused to recognize MLK Day. And, and as a result, a boycott was called. So we should know that there are precedents to Colin Kaepernick's stance. There are precedents to boycotting states and governments, and I'll say parenthetically, including the state of Israel. Now, around this time every year, we collectively reflect on the meaning of historical challenges against racism and their relationship to ongoing struggles uh, and, uh, against racism and other persisting injustices. So 37 years after the bill declaring the King holiday was signed, 34 years after the first celebration in 1986, and only 20 years since all states began to observe the holiday. But of course, it has been 52 years since Dr. King was assassinated. And so I am very happy to join you as you engage once more in a collective reflection on the occasion of Dr. King's 91st birthday. And I um, saw online uh, that there are a number of photographs depicting Dr. King's visit to this campus in 1962. Uh, and I read that the visit was uh, pretty much forgotten until uh, photos were discovered um, some years ago. Dr. King lectured uh, throughout the country. Uh, he lectured on uh, numerous um, college and university campuses. Towards the end of 1967, only a few months before he was assassinated, he gave five remarkable lectures for the Massey Lecture Series of the Canadian Broadcasting Company. These lectures were immediately published under the title, Conscience of Change. But after he was killed, they were republished under the title, Trumpet of Conscience. Some of my favorite MLK texts can be found in this slim volume. And each year, I find myself revisiting that volume. I urge you to read uh, these sermons 
they resonate as much today as they did in 1968. In 2010, Marion Wright Edelman introduced a new edition of the Trumpet of Conscience, uh, the Massey Lectures. And I'd like to share with you a few of uh, the words she wrote in the preface to the volume, to the new edition. Many, many, okay, the police are framing me, please help. Um, we'll talk about that afterwards, okay? Um, so I was about to, I was about to share with you uh, Marion Wright Edelman's words in the preface to the 2010 edition of Trumpet of Conscience. Many Americans, she wrote, remember Dr. King warmly, but have sanitized and trivialized his message and life. They remember Dr. King, the great orator, but not Dr. King, the disturber of unjust peace. They applaud the Dr. King who opposed violence, but not the Dr. King who called for massive nonviolent demonstrations to end war and poverty in our national and world houses. They applaud his 1963 I Have a Dream speech, and that's the only thing that many people know about Dr. King. They applaud his 1963 I Have a Dream speech, but forget how, as he told us in A Christmas Sermon on Peace, quote, not long after talking about that dream, I started seeing it turn into a nightmare. She goes on to remind us that many black people were opposed to his opposition to the war in Vietnam because it might turn President Johnson against civil rights. And she said that white people told him that it was not his place to criticize the war because he was not an expert on foreign policy, which parenthetically is also the message that is often directed to those of us who criticize Israel. The situation in the Middle East is too complicated. If we are not experts, we cannot be fully cognizant of what is going on in, in Palestine. Um, yes. And indeed, Dr. King pointed out in the third lecture on youth and social action that the conscience of an awakened activist cannot be satisfied with the focus on local problems. If only because he sees that local problems are all interconnected with world problems. <laughs> we know that people all over the world have continued to stand in solidarity with black movements in the U.S. Not only because they want us to eventually succeed in our centuries-old struggle for freedom, but because they recognize the extent to which people of African descent in the Americas have embodied the quest for freedom for five long centuries. Of course, there is the date 1619, which we all know. Uh, but there was also the slave uprising in 1522 on the island of Hispaniola, and the slave uprising in South Carolina, in what would eventually become South Carolina, in the year 1526. And in each of those uprisings, 
African people were assisted by indigenous people. And as a matter of fact, we cannot adequately narrate the history of the black struggle for freedom without taking into account the pivotal role that indigenous people played in that struggle. <laughs> and of course, the very first democracy um, was not created in the US or France, but rather in the Republic of Haiti. in a country where black people stood up and shed their chains. Um, that regardless of, of, of problems uh, in the aftermath of the revolution in Haiti, Haiti um, should still be recognized as having produced the first non-racial democracy in the world. Democracy in the U.S., as it was articulated by the founders who are so often evoked, was a democracy for a minority of the people living in what was the United States of America. Uh, certainly not for black people, certainly not for indigenous people, um, not even for, for white women. <laughs> but <laughs> speaking of miseducation, <laughs> um, but we celebrate Dr. King's birthday, Black History Month, um, and because black women are really the great unsung heroes. <laughs> we, celebrate, we celebrate during the month of March as well, Women's History Month. But speaking of anniversaries, this is um, the year 2020. Um, what significant centennial anniversary are we observing this year? What happened? So who, uh, who got the right to vote in 19? Okay. <laughs> I heard some people say women, but I think we should uh, beware of using terms uh, that, um, that purport to have a universal significance, but actually only re refer to a particular group. So those of you who said white women got the vote in 1920, um, that is what we should acknowledge. And that was very important. And I applaud that. But all women did not get the vote in 1920. Black women didn't. The majority of black women did not ac legally acquire the right to vote until 1965 with the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Speaking of women, as we celebrate Dr. King, we are really paying tribute to the women who organized and participated in the various campaigns that came to constitute what we call the Civil Rights Movement. And I want to pay tribute, particular tribute to black women domestic workers. Yeah. 
they are the ones who are responsible for the success of the Montgomery bus boycott, which was the catalyst for the mid 20th century black freedom movement. And as you know, um, if, if you have been sufficiently educated, uh, as, as you know, uh, the majority of people who rode the bus in Montgomery, Alabama were black women who were maids and who were um, washerwomen and who, black women who cleaned houses and cooked and so forth. They were the ones who were compelled to ride the bus from poor black neighborhoods to affluent white neighborhoods in Montgomery. When they, they collectively chose to imagine a different future and to refuse to ride the bus, respecting the call for the boycott that had been um, catalyzed by the refusal of Rosa Parks to move to the back of the bus. Uh, that was when change really began to happen. And I think it is important for us to learn how to pay tribute to those whose names we don't necessarily know. And to recognize, and to recognize that the agents of history are not so much the leaders and the spokespeople, but rather the masses of people who develop a collective imagination regarding the possibility of a new future. And domestic work. Domestic work is important work. It is the work that makes all other work possible. Alicia Garza, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, is also a leader of the Domestic Workers Alliance. And they point out that domestic workers do the work most precious to us, caring for our homes and loved ones, but they don't have the basic rights and dignity they deserve even in 2020. And of course, this is an issue that has global implications. Uh, and I am uh, attentive to Dr. King's statement regarding the connection between the local and, 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 and the global. Uh, uh, reproductive labor and care work uh, has transformed the worldwide economy. Uh, and um, if we used to, uh, because of our education and because of the impact of ideology, we imagine the worker as a white man. Now we must recognize that, uh, that workers are women, are girls, are women of color, women from the global south, uh, and are responsible for um, global manufacturing. You know, I always point out that whenever we put on a new garment, we should stop and reflect on who made it possible for us to wear that garment, who produced it. And of course, uh, this is a critique uh, using um, the terms of Karl Marx of commodity fetishism. Uh, but let me move on um, to talk about another issue that has global implications, the prison industrial complex. Uh, 
Um, and I want to very specifically focus on a, a law that was, um, that was signed at the end of 2018. How many of you are familiar with the First Step Act? Uh, and of course it was hailed in some circles as a major advance in the movement against mass incarceration. Um, well, the First Step Act um, focuses only on federal prisons and granted, and this is important, a few more federal prisoners will be released earlier than previously expected. But the overall impact on the numbers of people incarcerated in state prisons, in county and city jails, in jails in Indian country, in immigrant detention facilities, in military prisons, as well as in federal prisons is minimal. There was so much discussion about this um, important step forward, the First Step Act, uh, but most of the time it was not pointed out that this affects only about um, a point to only about 200,000 um, people. There are 2.1 million people in jails and prisons throughout this country. The, the largest population of incarcerated uh, human beings anywhere in the world. Uh, and of course, um, I didn't quite hear what you said, but right on. <laughs> <laughs> the, reason, the reason I chose to focus on uh, this um, relatively insignificant uh, development because so much political attention was bestowed on a measure that is so relatively insignificant with respect to the larger crisis that is responsible for the vast numbers of people incarcerated. And we know that a disproportionate, a vastly disproportionate number of them are people of color. <laughs> Including a rising proportion of women. As a matter of fact, we should uh, point out that one third of all of the women on the planet who are incarcerated are in jails and prisons in the United States of America. This, this um, hailing of this so-called achievement uh, is an indication of the continuing immensity of the problem. And this measure was readily embraced in conservative circles, uh, which, um, you know, when people like Newt Gingrich and um, Grover Norquist begin to say that they're opposed to mass incarceration, uh, we have to um, think a little bit more deeply uh, <laughs> about uh, what is going on. Um, uh, there's this uh, organization called Right on Crime that is the conservative, you know, Right on Crime, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I always thought they were saying Right on Crime. <laughs> <laughs> but according to Right on Crime Statement of Principles, an ideal criminal justice system, and I'm quoting, works to reform amenable offenders who will return to society through harnessing the power of families, charities, faith-based groups, and communities. Uh, you notice that there's nothing here about the responsibility of government. This euphemistic reference to the privatization 
of rehabil rehabilitation services uh, may have been inspired by the fact that uh, one of the largest corporations in the world, G4S, self-identified as the world's leading global integrated security company. G4S owns and operates prisons all over the, the country, uh, all over the world. Uh, it is the largest employer on the continent of Africa. Uh, it, uh, it has security services. It transports people who are being deported, uh, et cetera, et cetera but it also owns and operates sexual assault centers under the rubric, quote, quote, care and justice services, G4S boasts of its custodial and detention services, its immigration and border services, as well as its rehabilitation and settlement services. Uh, and what should strike you about all of these uh, services is that they're services for profit. Um, and so there's no deep interest in transformation or justice. Um, the direct involvement of ultra-conservative forces and governmental efforts to address the decades-old crisis of the punishment industry is an indication that the terrain has changed significantly since the contemporary anti-prison movement began to take shape, began to take shape during the early, um, the, uh, rather the late 1990s, the mid 1990s to the late 1990s. Uh, and of course, there are many people who are who are upset that uh, conservatives have have co-opted our vocabulary and they're talking about mass incarceration. Uh, uh, but rather than bemoan the extent to which conservative forces have taken the lead in putatively addressing the prison, the prison crisis, we recognize that our work in communities and universities has forced them to acknowledge the problem. As a matter of fact, this is how history changed. This is how history transforms. Um, masses of people who have been attracted to the campaign to end mass incarceration and more importantly to end the prison industrial complex, which is a part of the global uh, capitalist economy, uh, has resulted in in a uh, more um, in more visibility for the issue. As a matter of fact, during the mid 1990s, it was very difficult to speak publicly about this issue uh, because so many people assume that those who were in prison were in prison because they had committed a crime and therefore they must be enemies of society. And as a matter of fact, even people who had relatives in prison, even people who had experienced prison themselves were reluctant to be critical. So powerful was the assumption that society um, uh, uh, requires a space to deposit all of those who threaten uh, uh, the, 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 the lives and the property of, of others. Um, uh, but now we're in a different moment, a different historical moment. Uh, okay, I have five minutes left. Uh, um, okay. You know, I was, I was um, going to refer to the fact that there's been a proliferation of, of, of the presence of prisons in uh, visual culture, um, TV, film, popular culture, and of course uh, the 2016 Grammys with Kendrick Lamar's performance of The Black of the Berry, 
uh, represented a major turning point. Uh, So I actually wanted to say a few words about abolition <laughs> and to point out that, um, that abolition is not simply about abolishing the institution of the prison as a discrete institution. As a matter of fact, a myopic focus on the institution of the prison uh, tends to protect it from abolitionist criticisms. It is not enough to focus on abolition in the narrow sense. Uh, and, and in this, we have learned lessons from the so-called abolition of slavery, right? Abolition of slavery would have required the transformation of the entire society, not simply the breaking of chains. Slavery may have been designated as illegal, but all of the influences of slavery throughout the society remained intact. And abolitionists have come to recognize that our advocacy has to identify much more than the institution of the prison as the site for abolition. It is not possible to tear down prisons but leave everything else intact, including the structural racism that links the prison crisis to the larger society. And this is why feminist approaches are so important. And when I'm speaking about feminism, I'm talking about anti-racist feminism, anti-capitalist feminism. I am not referring to glass ceiling feminism. And feminism is important not simply to acknowledge that women are affected by the prison system and trans people and gender non-conforming people, etc. But feminist approaches help us to understand the centrality of racism. And I see your two-minute sign, <laughs> um, which means that I should probably uh... You know, the last section I'll have to um, uh, try to <laughs> um, You know, and I have to tell you, my notes were for a 45-minute talk, but the applause, <laughs> the applause is the reason why I'm having difficulty making it uh, to the conclusion. But um, let me, let me um, say that uh, uh, this period, has witnessed major advances. And I'm not talking about advances in, um, for example, in undoing the structural role of racism and the uh, challenging capitalism. I'm talking about advances in how we think about uh, what it is we need to accomplish in, in the future. Um, we had not, during the era of Dr. King, we had not yet begun to recognize how much more we would learn about injustice in the world. That standing against racism involves saying no to the repression of immigrants and challenging the way the southern border serves to criminalize people who are simply looking for a better life. It involves standing up against Islamophobia and the recognition that women, especially women who wear the hijab, are the most consistent targets of Islamophobic violence. It involves saying no to anti-Semitism. 
and at the same time recognizing the deeply racist policies of the State of Israel. Over the last decade, we have come to recognize how important it is to include critiques of the gender binary and support of trans and other gender non-conforming people in our agendas for social justice. Our trans comrades have done us a great service. They have let us know how important it is to always adopt a critical perspective, especially about those aspects of our collective lives that we most take for granted. It was once taken for granted that black people were inferior. The black body itself was considered the self-evident reason. If we succeed in rendering problematic the acceptance of the male-female binary, we may also be able to identify and challenge other aspects of our lives that are putatively self-evident. That which is self-evident more likely than not, reveals the impact of ideology. Finally, today we recognize that the ground zero of justice is the planet, climate change, the pollution of our oceans, our land. And we, we recognize here in this country that we owe it to the planet to guarantee that the current occupant of the White House is removed on November 3rd. No matter, no matter how you may think about the effectiveness of electoral politics. And I have to say that I am a person who believes that it is not always possible to express radical politics within the electoral realm. There are other realms for the expression of those radical politics. However, we all need to participate in electoral in the electoral arena because that determines the space we will have to be able to do the organizing that will move us into the future. So everybody has to go out and vote on November 3rd. Everybody, absolutely everybody. And, and so, what we most need now is to generate hope. Hope that must be continually regenerated and reinvigorated. And this is, I think, the collective challenge of today. Thank you very much. Uh, before you sit, please, one more time, join me in thanking our most powerful, wonderful, insightful, inspirational speaker, Dr. Angela Davis. As we conclude this year's MLK Symposium, I'd like to take this opportunity to give a personal thanks to Loomis Hilaire and Greg Thomas for their coordination of this year's MLK Symposium activities. As noted earlier, it takes scores of individuals to make this event possible, and coordinating such a group is no small feat. 
So please join me in giving Loomis and Greg a round of applause. Also, as we go forward from this place, I invite you all to participate in as many of the MLK events today and the following weeks as you possibly can. I guarantee you that they'll not only engage your mind, but they'll also nurture your soul. And last, it's only fitting that we close out the 2020 MLK Symposium with Dr. King's own words. In human relations, the truth is hard to come by because most groups are deceived about themselves. Rationalization and the incessant search for scapegoats are the psychological cataracts that blind us to our individual and collective sins. But the day has passed for blind euphemisms. He who lives with untruth lives in spiritual slavery. Freedom is still the bonus we receive for knowing the truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And always remember, freedom ain't free. Go forth and enjoy this wonderful day. Thank you very much.